Okay, it's working, Melanie. And Gail says hello on the YouTube hello. stream. <laughs> hello, Gail. Hi, Gail. <laughs> okay. When? So we are live, and then um, Daniel will start recording just for AWAS archives um, onto his computer at four o'clock. Okay, it's working, Melanie. And Gail says hello on the YouTube. Am I supposed to give talk at all? Um, so all the special guests, we're giving you one minute uh, to introduce okay. yourself. So I and I'll let you know when that happens. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, Michelle, I think we can start admitting people from the waiting room too. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll let everyone in then. Okay, thanks Michelle. Will everyone be? Um, so for the live stream, it's just whoever is speaking or whoever is spotlighted um, will be shown in the live stream. Uh, Melanie, I don't know if you saw as well, uh, a few people added their links for you to share um, in the chat as well. Yes, I'm adding now. Thank you. everyone, we'll get started in a couple minutes. Masma, um, thanks for letting me know about your camera. Do you want to try uh, if your audio works really quick? You can just say hello. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, we'll just get started in a couple of minutes. Um, still waiting for a few more people to trickle in.
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Lee, and I'm the board president of Asian American Women's Arts Association. And we are very proud to present our annual slide slam today. Uh, first, I wanted to set some ground rules and point to some housekeeping items in the Zoom room. We ask that everyone stay muted in respect for all of our speakers today. Automatic live captions are available if you need access to them at the bottom of the Zoom window where you can click the CC button and select show captions to view them. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to message um, the organizers. This event is also being recorded and live streamed to AWA's YouTube. We also want to acknowledge the privilege for being able to host this event online and for us to gather virtually on a Saturday afternoon. If we find that anyone is being disruptive or dis, uh, disrespectful in the chat, we will give you a warning and re remove you from the Zoom if the situation calls for it. Um, I also wanna take a moment to honor the fact that I and the rest of the AWA team are tuning in from unceded Ohlone land. We want to name and honor the stolen indigenous lands which we reside and rec recognize the agency of native peoples who continue to steward the histories and futures of these places. We invite you to share where you're coming from in the chat as well. I'm also grateful to our staff, wonderful volunteers and board members who are in attendance. Um, it's good to see Sherry Arai Debor, um, our Bedrock of the board, Kimmy Tara and Paloma Concordia. Um, and with that, I'll pass the mic to Diana who will share some announcements and introduce the program today. Hi everyone, hope you all are doing well on this sunny Saturday afternoon. Thank you for spending time with us today. Um, first, I just wanna start off by acknowledging the uh, anger, the frustration, the grief, the rage, the pain, and the exhaustion many of us have been experiencing in our communities um, over the past couple of weeks due to the events in Atlanta, Georgia. And also, uh, I want to recognize the Islamophobic rhetoric in response to the shooting in Boulder, Colorado, and just the anti-Asian violence in San Francisco and across the nation um, today. So, uh, for folks who aren't aware, yesterday was also declared National Day of Action and Healing. And as we continue to organize to stop the hate, we're grateful for all of you who could join us to uplift the voices of Asian American women in the arts through our annual Slide Slam. Um, nearly 32 years ago, AWA's co-founders Moira Roth, Flo Oi Wong, and Betty Kano rallied together to gather slides of artwork by Asian American women for the National Women's Caucus for Art. And this led to bringing visibility to the artistic contributions of Asian American women and shining a light on women of color artists to art historians nationwide. Um, so in a moment when our voices continue to be silenced by white supremacist, sexist and misogynistic bias, when the voices of six Asian women are silenced by a white man's bad day, when 68% of anti-Asian reports are coming from Asian and Asian American women, we are here proud and honored to continue bringing light to our stories and recognize the work of Asian and Asian American women in the arts. Um, so we also would not be able to gather here without the legacies of black indigenous people of color and the continued fight for racial and social justice in our communities. Um, there's a history of leadership and activism and resistance that has worked to empower and inspire us to speak truth and reclaim our voice. And today we are presenting our annual slide slam in the tradition of how AWA was founded 32 years ago. Today, 11 artists will present slides of their work to a group of special guests who include art historians, researchers, educators, curators, and PR, PR professionals, publicity, who will introduce themselves in just a short moment. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanna make a few quick announcements for what is happening at AWA soon. Um, let me share my screen real quick. So, Tomorrow, uh, Papadam, one of our uh, emerging curator fellows, Kamardeep Singh, has curated a show in the windows of the I Hotel Manila Town Center. Um, so you if you find yourself in the area, you can take a stroll around, around Kearney Street. 
um, and look through the windows of the I Hotel and, and see some of the work displayed there. Um, and then this APA Heritage Month, we're also presenting our um, exhibition in partnership with the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center um, and, the, uh, and their United States of Asian America Festival. Um, I just saw our wonderful preparator log in, so welcome that uh, to this slide slam. Um, and uh, Lisa, who is um, the curator for the show, is also participating in today's slide slam and will be presenting on the exhibition that we'll be sharing. Um, I know that's a lot of info on AWA. If you have any questions or want to learn more about us, um, you, can, you can find more info and donate at awa.net. And um, if you're interested in, or considering becoming a member with us, you can do that at this website, members.awa.net uh, as well. Um, so without further ado, um, I, let's get on with the slide slam. Uh, last year, I just want to say this was our first virtual event that we did when the shelter in place order happened. Um, so it's been quite a year and we're, we're really grateful to be here again um, and being able to do this um, with some of the artists tuning in across state lines as well today. Um, this event would not be possible without our funders, the San Francisco Grants for the Arts, San Francisco Arts Commission, and Zeller Rock Family Foundation. And we are also very excited to be in partnership with the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, who helped us invite a couple of artists who will be presenting today. Um, I also want to thank board members Pallavi Sharma and Lydia Nakashima Degarad and Jenny He, our new membership coordinator, who helped to gather and invite the special guests we have here today. Um, We'd, also, we'd like to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and we'll just go in the order that you all are listed on this slide right here. So Elisa, if you'd like to open it up um, and go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, um, Diana. And thank you so much for the invitation. It's so wonderful to be here today and to be able to support Asian American women and Asian American women in the arts. Um, my name is Elisa Alexander. I am the Assistant Curator of American Art at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford and the co-director of the newly launched Asian American Art Initiative, um, which seeks to make the Cantor and Stanford one of the preeminent centers of study for the history of Asian American art, um, especially on the West Coast. And uh, we are a collecting institution and we've made some wonderful recent acquisitions um, of historical material uh, of Asian American art and um, the press release can be dropped in the chat and you can learn more there. Um, I've been at the Cantor since fall of 2018. Before that, I was a Jane and Morgan Whitney Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art finishing my dissertation um, and I completed my PhD from uh, UC Santa Barbara. So I've been a California person for quite some time and I just recently moved to San Jose. And so I'm learning more about this part of the Bay Area and um, really nice to be here with everyone. So I'll let Gail take it from here. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to join you at this event. I've been involved with various forms of Asian art since I was a child living in Los Angeles. My earliest associations to Asian arts were through dance. Osamu um, Noguchi was a very close friend of my ballet teacher, Doris Niles. And I studied contemporary dance with Merce Cunningham at the Idlewild School of the Arts, as, as well as Japanese dance at a Buddhist temple in Gardena. Later at USC, I took a three and a half month study trip to Japan where we visited art centers such as Shigaraki. Based on my studies in Japan, it was natural that when I opened an art gallery in Washington DC, my first show was of a functional ceramist, Rob Barnard, who studied with Kazuo Yagi, considered the father of contemporary sculpture in Japan. I had no idea that functional ceramics were not considered high art in a U.S. contemporary art scene. Many of the curators from the Freer Sackler galleries at the Smithsonian's frequented my gallery and I owe a debt to them for their guidance through the years as we exchanged many hours both at my gallery and the Freer in discussions concerning the relationship between Western and Eastern art. During this time I was asked to curate several shows 
for the Japanese Embassy, the Japanese Ambassador's Residence, and the Japanese Chamber of Commerce. I also worked as an advisor to set up the Sasakawa Peace Foundation Gallery in Washington, D.C. After moving to the Monterey Peninsula, I worked with Sand City and the JACL to mount an exhibition titled Transcendental Vision, Japanese Culture and Contemporary Art. This was the first of several exhibitions I've curated for various groups in California. It is a natural connection at this time to be curating exhibitions concerned with the American concentration camps. I don't approach this from a historical or personal point of view, however. That is the concern of the artist in the exhibition. My part in this is to create an environment for thoughtful contemplation about one of the worst injustices perpe um, perpetuated on fellow Americans. That's it. Thanks, Gail. Laura, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Kina. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am zooming in from Chicago. Um, so this is the traditional homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, Ojibwe, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and also the Miami, Anoka, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee. Um, I'm an artist, a painter, and occasional curator, <laughs> um, and a professor at the art school at DePaul University, and I direct a graduate program in critical ethnic studies. And I've been involved in Asian American arts for a long time, way back in the 90s with a group called Destination in Chicago, Foundation for Asian American Independent Media, and then in the early 2000s, um, Asian American Artists Collective. And as I've gotten older, I've, you know, still producing art, but I've um, been work thinking, writing books and um, archiving things, archiving our history. So... Yeah, I've been involved in a pro on digital humanities project called the Virtual Asian American Art Museum and collecting oral histories of uh, Asian American artists. So yeah, I've been doing this for a while and realized we're always making events, but we have to tell our own, tell our story as well. So that's in addition to producing art, that's one of the through lines of my work is making sure I can open doors for other people. So nice to be here. Thank you, Laura. And is Marianne here? Um, Marianne, are you available to introduce yourself? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Welcome. Okay. Okay. I'm uh, Marianne Milford, and I was a professor at um, Mills College, and you may be hearing a lot about what is happening there. But um, I worked very closely with Moira Roth. She was my close colleague and friend, we're both from England, and so we had a lot in common. But she introduced me to uh, Flo Wong and um, Betty Cano, and I came up with the idea of establishing a center for um, Asian American women artists at Mills College, another th great thing that Mills did. And my field um, of research was actually India, um, I was a Sanskritist archaeologist and I was teaching Asian art history and she invited me to um, sort of sit in on some of the meetings, which I did, and that's how I met Flo and uh, Betty. And it actually turned my whole life around because I had students who would say to me, oh, all this wonderful old stuff, you know, all the architecture, the classical paintings in India, China and Japan, what's happening today? And I really didn't know. So it was thanks actually very much to Awa that I pivoted um, in my own professional career. And I spent two years in India on various fellowships, meeting with contemporary artists. And I actually did um, a major exhibition of contemporary women artists. And I focused very much on what they were doing because they were completely overlooked. And when I came back, that um, gave me an opportunity now to think, well, what are our women doing here? So I worked very closely with Mayumi Oda and um, with Zarina Hashmi and many other um, uh, uh, artists and Pallavi Sharma, uh, 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 who I um, met at Mills. And I've continued to um, be very closely attached to Awa because of what you are doing for the community and for artists and also for women too. And I was uh, very struck by the um, China uh, Chinese Cultural Center where they had the um, 
uh, gathering the other day, uh, focusing on um, Asian American artists um, and who were of um, uh, gay, uh, LGBTQ, or whatever, and uh, what you're all doing. I think it's really, really important. So I want to continue to support the um, AWA. Um, it's uh, been really uh, wonderful working with all of you. Um, and um, Cynthia Tom has been another uh, person that I've worked quite closely with. And I'm just about ready to meet, meet Diana Lee, I think in a Zoom talk next week. Um, so please keep up the good work and we'll support you as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Oh, Paloma, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm Paloma Concordia. Um, I'm a publicist and for over 15 years maybe now. And um, about 11 years ago, I started my own PR agency called Papa Lowdown Agency. Um, and our agency um, really focuses on arts, culture, and community types of um, clients and projects um, that are rooted in social justice. And just a little bit of background, um, I actually started this agency because I was inspired by arts activists in the Bay Area. And so um, AWA has definitely been part of that journey, Kearney Street Workshop, Cool Arts, um, newer orgs like Cultivate Labs and Soma Filipina. So, um, you know, uh, PR is, is my form of activism and amplifying the stories of Asian American and BIPOC communities. Um, as well as documenting. I mean, that's part of this process. I look at um, PR as a way to um, document our stories as well for historical purposes. Um, I have a mentorship program uh, as well as a public program. If you wanna learn PR, it's called PR for the People um, that Diana has gone through. Um, and she's like one of the best <laughs> examples of someone that's gone through this program. So talk to Diana. Um, if you're interested in that too. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm honored to be a, a new board member and excited to contribute to the legacy of AWA. Thank you for having me. And Tressa is next. Hi. Oh, can people see me? Because I, I don't know what just happened to my video. Yes, I believe there's something in front of your camera. Oh, there we go. We can oh. see you now. Okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, everyone. I am so honored to be here in the presence of so many great artists, curators, scholars, activists. Um, I'm zooming in today from Southern California on unceded Barbarino Venturena Chumash territory here in Ojai, California, where I currently work as an arts and cultural consultant, a creative coach, and art writer. Uh, the main thing, though, that draws me here and why I'm so honored and happy to be back in the company of so many known friends and colleagues is I have a longstanding history in the Bay Area as a former faculty of the San Francisco Art Institute, also the California College of the Arts, and I was a um, founding director of a nonprofit there, Border Zone Arts. We had a pretty good run for about eight years where I got to work in the whole expansive ecosystem of the nonprofit arts world in San Francisco Bay Area, which was fabulous because I got to know so many people. And some of you whom I know are out there in the audience. And I actually would love to put a shout out, if I may, to Lydia Nakashima Degrad and I think Lenore Chin is out there too and so many other friends thank you for being here and allowing me to be part of this amazing support network so um many things of course since i left the bay area but um i I'll, my heart will always be in san francisco <laughs> as is said and so are many of my projects in fact and clients um but in some of the intervening years i just want to interject that i had the opportunity and privilege to live and work in Australia as research faculty of the University Technology at Sydney, also at Queensland College of Art in Brisbane. And some of that work involved working with unpacking the regional 
identity of what does it mean to be Asia Pacific as an artist, you know, it's kind of a problematic category, especially in that region itself. So I just kind of want to bring that to the table it might be something that will organically come up in today's conversation. So, you know, with that, I'll turn it over and let the show begin. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tressa, and all of our special guests. We're so excited to, to get the Slide Slam started. Just to uh, let you all know, again, this Slide Slam is a rapid fire format. Um, so all the artists have uh, four minutes to pre present four slides of their work. And we're just now about to get started. Um, Kat, are you here? I just want to make sure. Yep, I'm here. OK, you ready? Yep, you're controlling okay. the, the screen, so, right? So yes, so right after Kat starts, um, we're just going to zoom by every uh, every person's art piece. Um, each, each slide will only be there for one minute, um, but you have four slides, so a total of four minutes to, to share your work. So um, without further ado, take it away, Kat. So I'm new to AWA, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, let me see, is my slide up? Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I started off with this slide because I'd say this would be a pivotal point in my painting career. I've been painting for tw over 23 years at this point, and this painting kind of represented everything that I wanted to be as an artist, <laughs> um, being inspired by Turner and the Impressionist era. Um, this really, this painting was, it just created itself. Um, and kind of started to define my style or my multiple styles, but the, the theme that runs through all of them is really the light that is brought through, um, that shines through. And yes, uh, it's, it was done at, let's see, an extension class at UC Berkeley. Um, I've done a lot of classes too at CCA and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, this next one, um, after I started doing my brush work, I actually wanted to dabble into palette knife. And I started doing that for about five years. Um, and this would be, I'd say, one of the culminating paintings that I've done in palette knife. Um, it's five feet by three feet. And this is of a sunset from my wedding weekend um, in 2018 in Hawaii. Um, again, light, dramatic light, um, and really having you feel, the viewer feel something on the other end. Um, I would say that a lot of people have gravitated towards this style. Um, I, I think after I painted First Light, I felt like it was my one hit wonder. And uh, as an artist, that, that imposter syndrome definitely comes in, but um, through working through other styles of painting, I've been able to, um, uh, beat down the uh, inner critic and start actually experimenting with different um, styles. So this one is another technique that I do that is um, taking oil paint. Oh, by the way, I'm an oil painter. So I started off with that one. Um, and I thin down the oil paint to a uh, watercolor-like consistency. And this, um, I use compressed air to move the paint on the page. Um, this style is more of a strive for composition and color um, versus my other styles, which have a lot of composition, but also it, it was really more about the feeling. This was more of like an object, um, which then kind of leads to the last style, which is what I've been painting most recently, which is I paint quite large and on the floor and on loose canvas. So I thin the oil paint down to an oil, to a watercolor-like consistency, cover the entire um, canvas. And I've cut them. I, I like painted on a 15 foot by eight foot canvas. I took that painting and I made it into four paintings and then I stretched them all. And then I go on top of them again with even more layering. So with this style, I'm using a lot of different tools to create it, but again, it's about the feeling and it's about the light um, that comes through. And a lot of times, a lot of people think that I paint worlds, like different worlds, which I think is very interesting because I love the sky and how it ever is an ever changing thing. And it's an ever 
um, always like supplying me with more inspiration for the next painting. So um, this is kind of, this is my latest piece called Brink, um, which is one of my favorites, but that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Thank you, Kat. All right. So that's the pace we're going. <laughs> Claire, are you here? Yes, All right, I'm ready? here. Okay. Yep. So thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Claire Lau. I was born in France. I grew up in Hong Kong and have been living in San Francisco for about five, five and a half years. I'm primarily a plein air painter. Um, I find plein air painting uh, especially important in today's digital age when everyone is constantly staring at their phones and not looking and connecting with their surroundings or other human beings. Um, so when I'm outside, I'm observing, learning, connecting connecting and really building a relationship with my environment. Um, and uh, this uh, painting is from my plant series. Uh, it's called Unfurling. It's 32 by 32 inches in oil on canvas from 2017. And it depicts um, an agave uh, that is emerging from a metal fence uh, next to a sidewalk. I like depicting um, urban plant life that is kind of struggling in, in the urban environment sometimes. Um, and uh, within the same um, plant series, I have my next slide, which is um, called Yucca. It is 36 by 48 uh, inches, very large in oils. I uh, painted earlier this year, my first painting of the year. Um, and I complete all of these large scale um, canvases on site. Uh, so this particular one took me seven sessions um, outside. Uh, I was particularly drawn to how this uh, yucca is stooping over the road and it's like really majestic gesture. Um, and to me, succulents here represent um, strength and resilience. Um, I will just note that the neighbor wants to cut down part of the yucca because it is infringing upon parking spaces. Um, uh, but in, in this particular view, I was really drawn to um, the, you know, the yucca itself and then the lush grass from uh, early spring, um, contrasting with, you know, the rocks and the road there. Um, and when I'm out there, I'm really absorbing the light, the colors, the sound, the temperatures, um, the life um, around me. Um, this one is a part of my cityscape series. Um, it is called Agave Overlooking Highway. It is 25 by 45 inches in oils. Um, it, I was really drawn to the mingling of the different types of plants in the wild hillside there, and then overlooking um, Highway 101 uh, and overlooking the rest of the city. Um, so you can see the highway kind of going into the space, through the space, weaving there. And then you see like the General Hospital, the rest of the city, Bernal Heights in the background, and then the San Bruno Mountains, like all the way in the distance. Um, and I'm really uh, drawn to kind of the, the uh, contrast between the urban um, and the natural kind of more wild um, areas of San Francisco. Um, and uh, which leads me to my last slide, um, which is also um, from my uh, cityscape series called Star King Panorama. It's uh, 20 by 80 inches. It's a diptych. So two canvases, I had to bring two canvases and easels. Um, it was painted late spring last year. It was my first quarantine time painting. Um, and uh, done at Star King Open Space on Petrero Hill. Um, and you can see everything from the Golden Gate Bridge up north to Bernal Heights south. Um, and uh, from Petrero Hill, which is you know, where my feet are, through the Mission, through Noe Valley, uh, up to Twin Peaks. Um, I really enjoy panoramas because um, your eyes are just uh, traversing, traveling through the space. You can see how everything is fitting together. And it's very humbling for you as a human being in that space. Um, and uh, if you want to see this painting in person, it will be shown at uh, Inclusions Gallery in Bernal Heights um, on Cortland Ave starting April 3rd. And I really um, hope everyone will be able to pop in. Thank you so much. Thanks, Claire. Crystal, are you here? Yes, I am. All right, getting started. And all of the, just for all the artists, you're getting a lot of attention and love in the chat. So make sure to check after your presentation. All right, take it away, Crystal. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal. And uh, 
Oh, okay, so I grew up half in San Francisco and half in Hong Kong. I am a filmmaker. I was an actress. My first two films were with Jackie Chan. But long story short is I'm in Honolulu now and I'm doing a PhD in performance studies, uh, questioning how documentary performs and how race and gender specifically perform because my documentary examines the Chinese in the segregated South following my grandmother. So my grandmother is in this old photo of mostly women and I focus on the women's stories because I feel like that's a way of disrupting the dominant narrative. And I come to this space as an art form because I feel like art, the art of weaving history and memory and the past and the present and the blurry space in this white and black binary is so important to dismantle. And so I enter her story um, through her growing up in the black neighborhood of Augusta, Georgia in the 1930s. I can have the next slide up, thank you. Um, and so this is my grandmother and her sister. And I started off as a, I wanted to do a feature film, but I decided I needed to do a documentary first to unpack the context to um, this incredibly relevant time of addressing anti-racism in the tensions between Afri African-American history and Asian-American communities. And so I blend that together in my documentary and I bring uh, focus to the voices of the women. So I'm gonna show you a clip before I run out of time and I can, if I have more time, I'll talk after that. Thank you. Segregated. No? No. So you had white people and black people in your school? We had only white people, but no blacks. Yeah. No blacks. There was no blacks. They could have stuck us in but black school don't that never did come up. Yeah. Did you think that the how did you feel how they treated the black people then? I don't care about that. I never thought about it because that's where we live. We live among the black people. We didn't have any trouble, but where Harry and his family lived, they were cutthroat. Kev, Mr. Warren, he's a credit my mother, you know, when we were growing up. I stayed right down the street there on Gust Avenue. Yeah? He's a credit, you know, let you know, yeah, tell my right. daddy get it, yeah. So, it was part of your life here, though, because you yes, came to the store all the time. I'm still here. I know, still, that's incredible. <laughs> so you don't have any comments on the Chinese when they're living here? Yes, ma'am, they're good people. Yeah. Very good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at that time is when they were talking you about were segregation, and, and you were going to either be yeah. here, and, and if they said, okay, they're colored, yeah. Yeah. so they've got to be over here on the black side. Yeah, I mean, so how do you think of this whole color line thing? Yeah, well, I, I, I think there were some smart people at that time frame that made the decisions that, uh, that kind of solved there was problems, but it wasn't you know, real bad. But you know, whenever my son was born, he was born in a civilian hospital. And the doctor I went to, when we went to the, when I went to the doctor, it was a black entrance and a white entrance. No. And the first time I went, I went, I'm not black. Well, I'm not white either. <laughs> Which way do I go? Which way do I go? This was okay, so so, so I said, okay, I'm more white than I am black. I'll go in the white. <laughs> See? But that's it. If it you was had confused. To, yeah, we had to decide. Thank you. I'll see you guys. Okay, see you. to question what it means to the blurry middle and how we disrupt these racial narratives through the stories from an Asian American perspective on this uh, black and white uh, history that we are confronted with. Sorry, I'll mm -hmm. just Hi. make this full screen again. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Crystal Masma, Dr. Masma Ahmed, are you here? Hi, this is Masuma Ahmed. Thank you for <laughs> including me in this slide slam. I'm originally from Bangladesh and I'm heavily influenced by the folk art traditions of Indian subcontinent. So, because I feel that representational of those invisible women in the rural areas 
uh -huh, that I feel they, they have a lot of voices, but they're invisible. So I want to carry that invisible voice into the mainstream. And I'm heavily influenced by the color and the folk art traditions of Indian subcontinent. So basically it reflects that. And also I'm very proud of our full mothers in terms of uh, uh, relating to the histories, folk tales and the stories of our, not of just of our ethnic background, but from our history. Like we as women were the gatherers from the prehistoric time, from the gatherer hunters times. And we were the first so this is basically representing the women and their voices and across um, different ethnic and different colors. I'm a woman of color and I feel strongly that we need a voice in the mainstream as well. So this is a woman during the pandemic. She's working while taking care of her family uh, inside the house. And my art... Um, takes um, takes not just the folk art tradition, but also I mix my traditional platform, which I do primarily on canvas uh, using acrylic and also collage. And then I'm intermixed with the digital platform to bring the richness of both traditional and the digital media. So this is a combination of both digital and the traditional media. So it's a mixed technique. And this is, again, a, you'll see there are all these women uh, doing weaving. So I go back to that traditions to bring out what are we as women, uh, not only of colors, but women across the globe are contributing to the infrastructure of our society, but we don't have the voice that we need across the globe. It's not just uh, privileged women, but I'm talking about women across the globe from rural areas, from urban, uh, you know, including urban areas. Like I paint women when I stayed in the hotel, those maids, they provide valuable services, but they're not in the mainstream. So I collect their stories, I write poetries, and I have a site called New York City Rainbow Faces, where I gather my write-ups about those women and also the arts of across the globe uh, that transcends. And this is about this Asian hatred that happened recently showing that we're still hopeful. We can overcome these racial prejudices uh, with the, using lantern as a symbol, as the lantern of hope that will rise above hatred and we will be, um, not only rise up, but we will also stand up and resonate our voice across the across this country to say that we exist not only exist as human beings, but we are powerful. So I cannot deny our power. So we have to use our power, and thus this symbol represents this lantern. And again, as I said, I mix both traditional and the. Um, 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 digital world together to come bring this uniqueness in my artwork. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Masma. Julie, are you here? Julie T. Underhill. Welcome. Thank you. Take it away. Hi. Hi thank you so much for inviting me. I'm Zooming in today from the site of the Jurassic Artist Residency in Woodside in unceded Ohlone territory. I have been a photographer since 1994 and spent 15 years primarily working as a black and white 35 millimeter photographer. And the work I'm sharing today is from that time period. Um, during my first trip to my mother's home village in Vietnam in 1999, I had never seen any photos of the Cham community in Vietnam. We are an indigenous people um, conquered by the Vietnamese and made now into an ethnic minority. And um, at the time in the late 90s, there wasn't an internet presence. So when I was traveling there for the first time, my mother asked me to document the family for her because she wouldn't see her mother before she died. 
So this series originally began in a sense to help my mother see her family before her, her own mother passed away, who's featured here in this photograph with my cousins. But as I came home from this trip and realized that as a documentarian, I had created something that I had never seen before, um, it was important for me to continue learning about the Cham and researching our history and our culture. Um, over a number of years, I was aware that my grandmother needed a reburial ceremony and that I would eventually be returning to Vietnam for that. Um, I took a few other trips that weren't focused on the Cham, but the series on the Cham is about indigenous representation. Um, there's a self and other component. I am Cham, but I also did not grow up in this community. Um, I was a visitor to my own family. And although there's a sense of intimacy because I was connected, there is also um, some degree of, of being an outsider, which I navigated um, throughout both trips. So these are all family portraits created, you know, to make a record for the family, but also to make a record you know, for posterity in a sense. Um, I've also visited Cham communities in Cambodia where um, we were targeted under the Khmer Rouge um, for genocide. And I documented that community as well in color and black and white. And I'm currently working on a book manuscript that includes the work on the Cham in Vietnam and Cambodia um, in order to, you know, show who we are and to show where we live and um, to reverse the notion of our disappearance, which sometimes is the narrative used against us. Um, indigenous peoples around the world struggle to um, prove they still exist, that we still exist. And um, sometimes documentation is the best way to do that to some extent. So this final image is my mother reuniting with her mother's sister on her first trip to Vietnam in 31 years. There's a sense of gravity and sadness in this image because everyone was conscious of what was happening, that a family that had been separated by war were now um, rejoining and it was, not an easy return in many ways. Oops, <laughs> that's my four minute mark. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to share this family story, the story of culture, indigeneity, representation, self-representation, surviving and um, self-definition. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Hi, Melissa, take it away. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a self-taught abstract artist working in painting and installation. I grew up in San Pedro, California, a place where I did not see black, brown, and yellow girls playing with each other. So I've always been interested in racialized femininity and this dialectic between wonder and estrangement that inform our experiences of otherness. So last summer, I, during an art residency, I teamed up with a group of local activists to create an art photo shoot called Echo's Garden. Um, here, women of color, a term that emerges from otherness, is expanded to consider the feminine divine in spaces like the state parks. I've long tried to erase BIPOC existence. What does it mean to enter and play? And in fact, the day after we wrapped up the shoot, I was harassed by a state park ranger. So the project literally embodied that inquiry. Um, next slide, please. As a former designer and academic, I began full-time art making. I didn't begin full-time art making until 2019. Um, and um, I work primarily in acrylics. So um, from late 2019 to the end of 2020, I was working on a series called The Word for World is Forced. Um, Ursula, which comes from an Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, uh, the title of one of her novellas. So her critique of the history of Western expansion as killer stories inspired me to imagine life stories. This is Life in Ruins, a painting that meditates on force and fire and more broadly thriving in precarity. Overall, the series attempts to subvert human exceptionalism, the human-centric mindset that values certain sentience over others, 
by creating an alternate phenomenology that sees the sublime in nature. Next slide, please. In February of this year, I wrapped up my first uh, solo installation at Root Division called Without the Stars, There Would Be No Us. Mirror sculptures on Myler Grids um, imagine celestial objects traveling at the speed of light and experience that the human mind can only dream of. Um, I found myself thinking, this is when I found myself thinking more specifically about the, and more explicitly about the ontology of cons consciousness, like how does our consciousness come into being? Um, I work primarily in, um, I, I really enjoy using light and I, I noticed that these, these elements, color, shape, light and mark, they reflect for me the phenomena of matter, which are the components of our observable universe. And the energy that drives my process then is this quest for imminence, uh, what I consider you know, the inherent and eternal form of spirit that predates any social or man-made order and is in fact rooted in the stars. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is new work. It's about, I would say, 5% 5 5 done. And um, it's made up of shredded textiles, including my grandmother's cheap house. And I'm actually gonna do another interactive art photo shoot with the same team as Echo's Garden, uh, focusing on Asiatic femininity inspired by Anchin's text, uh, Ornamentalism. It's part of a larger uh, project I'm working on with a couple artists and an art show that focuses, that I want to highlight women artists of Asian descent. Um, the kernel that we're working with is how do we perform or produce culture and labor? How does resili resiliency, love and care for our families show up in our labor intensive work or works? So um, if you're interested, please reach out. <laughs> we could, uh, we're looking for uh, South and Southeast Asian artists in particular and um, curators, uh, if you're interested. And that's it for me. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, Mitsuko, here you are. Uh, hi, my name is Mitsuko Brooks, and I'm zooming in from the land of the Lenape. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and just to do a quick plug, I'm going to be presenting this work that I'm showing here with the Japanese American National Museum on April 14th um, over Zoom, but in Los Angeles. Um, and it's kind of being led by the artist and activist Tracy Kato Kiriyama. And um, so I work primarily in male art. Um, this is one of the pieces the to and from are on the opposite side. And this was walking to the post office and just taking pictures of various male art pieces um, with the, you know, the natural surroundings on the way. Um, yeah, so I work in mail art and my, my uh, work focuses on diaristic sharing through letters written to friends and strangers. Um, this recent body of work is um, entitled Protest Songs. Um, and then there's some also just letters, but these pieces were documenting chants that were overheard and words that I saw on cardboard signs during the 2020 protests during the pandemic. Um, and so I hand paint the words and then I write like the citations on these book covers. Um, and this body of work was realized during the pandemic and partially as a solution that I couldn't always have my body on the streets. And then it was also um, allowing more of like a quiet protest voice. Um, yeah, and then sent through the postal system to different recipients. And um, my mail art um, kind of emerged during a riot girl scene era, the 1990s, and it helped me cope with a transient childhood. We moved around a lot and um, a lot of it operated as resistance and um, just like a way to give myself a voice and documenting whatever experience I was going through and very much about the personal as political. And um, 
So also part of um, not just being an artist, but I'm also um, in graduate school studying archives and library science. And I held um, positions like that in the past. And so I would collect these discarded book covers. And so that is what is the base of these pieces that you're seeing. Um, yeah, and I'm really interested in the historical value of letter writing, capturing the thoughts of the writer, um, whether it seems relevant at the moment, but um, it could be beneficial to researchers in the future. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's about it. But thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Mitsuko. All right, Monica, ready? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Monica T. Uh, and as an artist, I like to challenge people to explore the intersections of culture. And my pieces are often born from personal experience and share a common thread with many Chinese and Asian Americans. This first piece is called Obliterate. It uses traditional like red and gold colors and is painted in an abstract Western style using a medium called alcohol ink. Uh, the red and gold colors are kind of what remind me of the Lunar New Year and the vibrant colors I often see in sets of like Chinese dramas set in olden times. Uh, I created this piece when I asked myself, what does it look like if I took an art te technique commonly shared like in Western social media culture and applied a traditional Chinese lens on top? It's a way to join the conversation and add to it by flipping around the color palette. And it's also a way to kind of like show up loud and like be proud of my unique perspective. This next piece, Mother Tongue, tells a tale of stumbling through my native language. It reads top to bottom, starting with the circle strokes, which is a technique used to warm up your arm when you practice calligraphy. Uh, and as your eyes travel down the piece, the broken words in the middle represent what should come naturally, but doesn't come naturally anymore. Uh, the fractured pieces of rice paper are like the words that like trip on my tongue and are no longer familiar in shape. So much of this piece tells my relationship with language as part of identity. The insecurities of not being fluent and unable to communicate with my family are rough for me and I'm sure many other second generation immigrants. And the scroll kind of concludes with an affirmation and reconciliation with the bold Ren character in the bottom left corner that proclaims we are whole as we are. Uh, so my first two pieces centered upon the importance of color and language in community, communicating culture and identity. This next piece by Yang Mi is about living in the conflict of Chinese and, and American culture and the manifestations of intergenerational trauma. The repeated words on the mirror translate roughly to, it wasn't worth raising you. These are the words that were imprinted on me from family when I didn't meet their expectations. And I was left asking myself, like, what do these words mean from a mother who immigrated to the US from China? And what do these words mean in a culture where the practice of love is not the same? The mirror further asks, what does it feel like to grow up with one culture but living within another? And what does it feel like when the words your parents say to you don't make sense in the context? And what traumas occur when cultures clash? Uh, my intention with the last painting is to comment about the absurdity that a large and diverse group of people could be reduced to a color whenever convenient. And at the same time, people will deny that the group is subject to discrimination. Yellow is a color. And it is also about how this particular color seems to only matter sometimes. It is at once obvious and innocuous, but there are times when it becomes a reason for discrimination. This society has taught me yellow is a color and I'm apparently that color. And it's also taught me when I'm called yellow, it means I'm other or not from here. Yellow is a lowercase c color when we're described as a model minority and yellow is also a capital C color that describes a multitude of experiences and cultures. Um, so that's kind of all I have for today, but 
thanks for having me part of the slides, yeah. All right, thank you, Monica. Tara, are you ready? Um, yes. All right. Okay. Hi, my name is Tara Tamari Bucci. I'm a Chinese and Japanese American. I live in Seattle, but I grew up in Irvine and my mom was born and raised in San Francisco, Chinatown. Uh, so I'm excited to meet you all today through um, AWA. I'll share three projects that my practice is currently focused on. Um, this is the Camouflage Net Project at the Seattle Center in 2017. It was a response to the Muslim ban at the time and photos Dorothy A. Lang had taken at Manzanar of Camouflage Net Factories. And later iterations have connected it to migrant incarceration and prison labor today. Um, Dorothy A. Lang's photos overturned my assumptions of what camp labor could be like. Uh, Japanese Americans made tens of thousands of these nuts for the army. And I was surprised to see folks engaged in the handiwork of weaving. So I wanted to connect my working hands to that of my incarcerated community. And I chose to weave kimono fabric for its materiality to send pride of heritage back in time as many folks felt ashamed of the incarceration experience. And the end result is a camouflage net to walk through. Uh, camouflage protects people and objects. It visually blends them in with their surroundings. And so I think of this net as a discrimination filter um, that helps us envision the true nature of people as interconnected with each other and the world. Um, the next slide is a social practice museum intervention at the Seattle Asian Art Museum. And I, I'd like to do this at more museums with Asian collections. My goal is to bring back the living context of the Dharma to Buddhas that are in these museums and alleviate the sense of erasure we feel when seeing our material culture as aestheticized. Um, museum visitors made paper flowers and learned to make a flower offering to a Qin Dynasty marble standing Buddha. And so they were engaging and activating it. And I was really surprised to see how interested the visitors were in doing this. And with the Seattle Betsuin Buddhist temple, uh, we had three services in which we chanted sutras. And it was really great to see that museum visitors also wanted to join us in chanting. And um, I, uh, the temple members felt seen and healed by this experience. And I'd like to open it up to other um, sects of Buddhism and other uh, sanghas um, around the US and maybe in other countries. And then in the last slide is a video. Um, it's my MFA project I've been completing through Leslie Art and Design in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this will be July 2nd at Mass Mocha. Uh, I found, and that's our MFA show is then. Um, it's prompted by my diary that I found uh, when I was a raver in the 90s or from when I was a raver in the 90s, but I didn't recognize myself as the author. So I built this Merit Han Dynasty burial suit as a disco burial suit to memorialize my past self and Gen X rave culture. Um, I orchestrated a spatial installation that's structured around the main types of um, mindsets that diasporic people tend to inhabit as defined by Homi Baba in his book, Location of Culture. Uh, the burial suit expresses homeland idealism, but it finds empowerment through ancestral forms. The vitrine box is a metaphor for the model minority myth, but the suit is liberated from being boxed in. And overall, the installation is an expression of the liminal mindset in which diasporic people organically self-determine their future. And um, in working on the project, I recognized my past self was liberating itself from model minority thinking, engaging with a liminal mindset as a raver. And I underline this mindset through projection and sound with source material from my personal camcorder footage from raves I took in the 90s with elements of groove and vibratory sound as material to get viewers in touch with their true essence. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my work with you today. Thank you, Tara, that was amazing. Trin, are you here? Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, here you go. Okay, so um, my work tells the stories of the mass exodus of the Vietnamese people during the fall of Saigon and dovetails it into the current immigration crisis, which threatens to detain and deport us unlawfully um, back to the communist regime from which we fled um, during the 70s and 80s. 
Um, so this piece is called Flesh of My Flesh, and it's a life-size portrait of my husband, Hien. And there he is standing on a mound of dirt that's been collected from the garlic farms um, in which him and his family worked on when they first arrived in America. So there he's standing confidently upon this unstable ground that is the system. Um, this piece was inspired by Psalm 91, which is a prayer for protection and courage and was written during times of war. Um, verse five says, um, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. And it made me think about how so many of the raids happen at night when families are most vulnerable. Um, verse seven continues, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Um, so thinking about the arrows that are being shot at us as we're being hunted um, during this time. So Hien is um, Vietnamese, Cambodian American, um, and the birds that find their way into my work represent uh, migration, liberation, ascension from hardship. Um, there's an American goldfinch there that's perched on his head. Um, the goldfinch is a permanent resident of the United States. Um, and it's protecting his mind from worry and fear as we navigate through this crisis. Um, the silver-breasted broadbill is there perched on his shoulder. It's a native of Cambodia, um, whispering wisdom into his ear because it's the wisdom that we need to fight this battle effectively for us and for others. Um, and there on his arm is a Vietnamese green finch, um, which is only found in Vietnam. Um, and it's guiding his arm so that he can move in grace even while displaying strength. So the arrows that you see here are all handcrafted um, using only found objects, found branches, found feathers, found string, um, using indigenous methods as well. So there's 12 different arrows throughout um, the installation using different feathers from different birds, um, which illustrates the array of peoples and communities who have been suffering through this crisis. Um, so I've treated um, the, the found branches um, in multiple baths um, I've straightened them over flame, um, whittled them down, fletched them with found string, wax. Um, this one is made of parrot feathers that I found um, in Orange County, which holds the largest population of Vietnamese outside of Vietnam. And I'm also using uh, multiple water sources, so in the paint and also to carve out those holes that the arrows are puncturing through. Um, I've used tears shed for Hien when I think about the hardships he's gone through and his resilience and strength and faithfulness throughout this. Um, also water that I gathered from the San Pedro Harbor where he was held in immigration detention before the facility was finally shut down to, due to the insurmountable occur occurrences of staff offenses. So they were pretty much legally and systematically torturing people before it was um, closed down. Um, this one's called, uh, for We Are Called to Freedom. It's a drawing of Vietnamese green finches and American gold finches. Um, on paper, 60 by 72 inches. Um, the white on white allows the birds to kind of appear and disappear. So it illustrates the ones who have had to go into hiding with the hope that there will be a time when we can resurface. Um, again, thinking about how our immigrant and um, immigrants and refugees are being sought after and hunted. So on each one's heart, um, there's a little cross on their um, hearts. Um, representing a stamp of courage, also echoing the crosshairs from the scope of the weapons that are aimed at us, um, representing faith, and also resounding the crosses that are found on first aid kits, um, which represent, you know, the preservation of life, the need to preserve these lives um, during this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trin. All right, the last one is we have Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Hi. Um, wow. I'm, I'm really just floored by all the artists who have come before me and just like appreciating the stories of pain and heart um, and artistry. It's just truly beautiful. Um, so I'm joining us today from Kume Ye Land and I'm talking about sewing, sewing agency. Um, so I think this show for me really started with the climate crisis that we're in right now, um, that we've been in for a really long time. And when I really think about the root of that, I think at least here on this land, so much of it is connected to colonization as like the first really huge um, like impact there. And so I think as the show is beginning to emerge, like the things that really were coming up for me and for um, Awa were just this anger and frustration at the climate catastrophe and also the absence in so many ways of um, 
our voices from being in the center of that and specifically of artists' voices. And so what we wanted to do is create a space where we could kind of engage that a little bit more and really bring that into the fold. And so right here, we have a number of artists who are participating in the show. We have Trisha Rainwater um, Tutweiler, um, Pam Tao Lee, Christiana, oh, actually Christiana Chen in the corner and Claire um, Lau, who we heard earlier today. And I, what I find so powerful about the pieces in the show is just how this like depth of resilience and like resistance and community leadership action. And those were things that were felt really important for us to center in this. But I think also in that too, is this continued connection to land, um, continuing to document what's happening in the world around us. And I think for so many of us as artists, um, I don't think there's any way that you can make art that isn't tied to like personal healing um, and to the personal experiences that we're going through. I think art is such a powerful vessel to channel some of these really difficult things that don't make sense. Um, and this one, we have another piece by Pam Tali and we have a piece by um, Pallavi Sharma and um, Radical Family Farms and um, a piece by Francis um, Kai Hua Wang. And I think like, What's so powerful for me as a curator is just like how much you can create spaces that reflect the questions that you're really curious about and actually not just create space for that art, but to really create space for um, conversation around that and for community around that. And I think there's a really huge space for community engagement within that. Um, and so the show is coming up um, in a number of weeks. Our opening is on April 30th. And I think something else that's been really important for us as we've been participating in the show is partnership. And so we've been, we've been really fortunate to work with so many different orgs. Um, you've right here, you can see the website. And I think the website's really lovely because you can just like see all the people who are here who are participating in it. Um, and I think at the bottom, you can see some of our partners as well. Um, we've, I think that, one thing that makes me really proud about this list is I don't think anything ever happens um, really by itself. It always happens within community. And I think that's really an approach that AWA takes very strongly. Um, and so I think that is how, what I'm gonna say about the show right now. Thank you again for um, letting me join the space with all of you. Amazing. Oh my goodness. Let's give a virtual round of applause. Everyone unmute if you want to do a sound or something. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so we have an opportunity now to um, open the space up for comments and questions. And if you all want to stay until 6 p.m., um, after we've kind of like, depending on our, where our energy is at after we're done with comments and questions, we'll have a moment to um, shift into breakout rooms um, for folks who want to stay in network as well. Um, and those breakout rooms are going to be separated under the topics of archive and academia, publicity, and then um, and curation. Uh, so so um, if, if anyone wants to share any comments right now out loud, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, or any questions for any of the artists too in this larger group. I, I'll just echo some of what's happening in the chat as well. Um, Kimmy says, amazing. Thank you everyone for sharing your words and your work. Um, thank Diana, Jenny and others for your hard work in organizing this great slam. Thank you so much. Um, and then feel free to post questions in the chat as well. We're getting lots of love in the chat. <laughs> okay. I have a question for some of the artists who do more documentary work, um, especially the ones that like, like document their family. Like how, how do you kind of like hold everything 
because having the family ties is like very personal but then you're also talking about like really tough topics and I'm just kind of curious what your experiences have been. Um, I, um, I just mourn. <laughs> I sit in the studio and I, I work and I mourn. Um, and the reason why I started using my tears because I was shedding so many of them and I didn't want them to go to waste. <laughs> you know, I felt like no pain. And I, I know this to be true from my own experience is that no pain is wasted. And it's very hard to remember that when we're going through it. Um, so I just, I have to make work to honor, um, recognize the pain and honor the pain, but also like, the strength that we have, because how do we know how strong we are if we don't suffer? Not that we want it, but it's, um, yeah, I just feel like there's like this strength and this courage that we don't even realize we have when we have to go through these things. Um, so how do we do it? Um, we just make things. <laughs> we make things and we share our stories and then other open up the door um, for other people to share share the story so we could sit in it together. So thank y'all, love y'all. I totally agree with what you said. Um, actually, as, as I was practicing for this slide slam, I was telling my friend I was worried I was gonna like start crying when talking about one of my pieces. So like, I, I definitely feel you on that. I think I'd also add, um, I'm, and I'll speak more as an artist um, than as a curator. Um, I think there's something really powerful about art too, because sometimes it feels like with words, there's only so much you can work through with your family, but there's something about like making something together or like having like this really clear way in which you're engaging that opens up possibilities for communication and connection that I don't think could exist um, like without art. And it, I, I find that to be really healing. Um, I would like to add that I am in agreement with the comments being made so far. Um, and as someone who um, has negotiated a lot of loss in my life, you know, throughout my life, um, there's a phrase from someone that whatever you feel will find its own form. And um, to some extent, you know, putting things into art or poetry is is sort of like a release valve, so it doesn't just keep building up. And I think that that has been a powerful vector for self care and um, transformation, and you know, just knowing what is and what's coming up. For me, I'd like to share that in my process, you know, Asians tend to not want to open up a can of worms, right? You don't want to talk about uncomfortable things. And so when I dig into issues that they don't want to address, how do I frame that? Like, what do I leave in and what do I leave out? And how do you see beyond the silences? Like, how do you read into what they're not saying? And there are so many layers in that that you don't see in the end product, but is my process um, that I struggle to find space to express too. So thank you for this. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate everyone sharing their stories today. I feel like there is, there's more than just art that's presented. There's a, there's a depth to, to all of your work and I, I really appreciate you all having the courage to, to share. Um, yeah, if, if there aren't any questions from any of the audience as well, I'd like, I'd like to open up the space to some of our special guests to come back and, and share any comments um, and witnessing some of the pieces too, or any questions too.
Elisa or Gail or Marianne, Paloma. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. I was just thinking that as a curator curates, sometimes you get involved in other people's art to the point that you absorb it and it becomes you. And when you're putting the work together, the same thing can happen. That it's not an individual anymore. It's an installation. So that's what I try to, or I don't do this purposely, but it happens. All of a sudden you see that you've created an art piece out of seven other artists' work. And it's mind boggling that it all works together because of the ideas inherent in the work that reach out to each other. Sometimes I think it's like Toy Story. At night, the art comes alive and interacts and it's beyond comprehension, but there's kind of a, a mystique going on or a mystery. Um, and stories are told between the paintings or the artwork. You just really want to know. You want to be part of that, but you're always, you know, not in the Toy Story yourself as you look at it. You understand? <laughs> Seems. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone for your wonderful presentations, and I was so um, impressed with all of these diverse practices. And I, you know, from a curator's perspective, always really appreciate hearing directly from artists themselves. And what I really love is when you walk us through pieces and you really tell us your thought process and the like making process behind it, because these are the types of things that like, you know, are, are not things that we can know necessarily unless you tell us, or we have some familiarity with the media. So it's really just wonderful to, get that insight into really what you were thinking or like why you chose a certain media. Um, I'm looking at my notes here and like Claire, it was great to hear like why you were drawn to the on plein air painting and like what your reasoning was behind it. And then um, I love that we had so many works that explored the nature of the documentary as a medium itself. And so um, I really appreciate um, just even the curation of the artists who are selected for today and the chance that we had to see um, so many different types of practices. So thank you. Hi, I just wanna say thank you yeah, to all the artists. Um, you know, I think art is so powerful and healing and educating um, people. And um, you know, that's what we need right now. Um, with everything that's going on. And um, so thank you for creating and, and keep creating. I am not an artist, but I am a huge fangirl of, of artists. And so, um, you know, artists have inspired me to, to do my work. And so thank you and keep doing that. I know it's, you're putting yourselves out there and, um, and that's difficult to do, um, but it, it truly matters to those of us that are not artists. And, and so thank you for creating that for everybody. I should have prepared coherent thoughts before this, is it? Um, but uh, <laughs> I just, I really appreciate, I don't know, is it my, am I on screen right now? Yes, sorry. we see it. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I'm Laura. Um, I just was, um, before this, I only was familiar with Julie's work. So I just, you know, taking in all the information about the artists and wrote a lot of notes about you, things I might want to follow up in the future. Um, Catherine, I really appreciate you talking, you know, I'm a painter, so I really appreciate you talking about your process and um, how you put things on the floor and then restretch that. And um, I was just thinking like, I wanna see you like mask out certain areas and then do the palette knife over that, you know, just sort of as a technique. Um, Crystal, so you're working on a PhD in Hawaii and your documentary is finished. You've already done the research for that and it's based it in- not, It's not complete yet. It's oh, so hard to find- Going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, still working mm -hmm. on it, finalizing it now. I was Very wanting cool. to know a little bit more about the performance and documentary, how that's coming together. 
you know, performance studies is a relatively new area and people don't recognize that and acknowledge that as, a, as, as an important way of, of unpacking um, things. And, and I, I just feel like um, there is a performative lens in everything we do. You know, for me, this situated in this grocery store that I'm researching in the, in the black neighborhood of this, this small town of Augusta is a performative space. It's like a store is like a stage where you have encounters between these Chinese who were there as storekeepers and the black customers who were there. And they were situated together because of the white supremacist structure that built this place to begin with. And there's just so much to unpack if we see things as a stage. And that's where I'm going with this and, and, and unpacking the kind of the gendered roles that the women play under a very patriarchal kind of Chinese family, as well as the patriarchal system of the, um, you know, black and white narrative of this country. And so, again, it's just for me fascinating to understand um, and try to um, unpack these, these very timely issues now through this uh, performative lens. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> I have questions for so many people. Oh. Um, Julie, oh. I also, you know, yeah. admire your work after for a, a meeting. Time. have a meeting. Um, and just, you know, being mixed race and Okinawan, I also really relate to that, um, learning about being. I think we accidentally muted the wrong person. So Laura, if you could repeat what you said, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I think you muted yourself again by accident. Okay. There you Take go. Three, yes, we can five. hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is for Julie, just more of a comment. Um, so I'm mixed race, Unchinanchu, Indigenous Okinawan. Um, and I've you know, appreciated Julie's work um, and what you're doing um, and documenting your family and Chama identity. And I'm curious to know what happened after that series. Can you hear me? Um, a lot of things have happened after that series. Um, one thing that did happen that I, I sort of alluded to is I eventually went to Cambodia 11 years after I first uh, photographed in Vietnam. And that trip was to understand the Cambodian experience or the Cham Cambodian experience because the, the Cham in Cambodia represent the first diaspora under the conquest of, of Champa in, in what is now Vietnam. And so they were in Cambodia for hundreds of years, pretty much left alone until the Khmer Rouge era. And I was really interested in understanding how their experience under the Khmer Rouge, um, how they'd assimilated that and how they'd recovered uh, if, if they had recovered. And so I spent a month with a very close friend of mine who has, is Cham from both Vietnam and Cambodia. And we visited her family, but we also visited different communities in Cambodia um, who survived the genocide. And I hadn't, <laughs> I hate admitting this, but I'll just be honest with you. I hadn't processed that film until just this year. And so it's the the it's 11 years old, but I I just have my I don't even have contact sheets yet. So I am, you know, trying to expand the series so that there is a representation of the Cham in Southeast Asia, which, you know, there's very little knowledge on this community. I'm often telling people about the Cham for the first time. There's Vietnamese people who think the Cham were all wiped out, you know, because they know about the Cham, but they don't know that we, we survived and, you know, genocide in, in Vietnam. So it's been really important for me to, to bring the Cham from Cambodia into the narrative um, because um, the Cham in the United States, the communities are quite separated. And as an activist and scholar, of the Cham community, I've also tried to bridge these divides that have happened between um, where we came from in order to paint a, a much bigger picture of who we are as a people. So as far as the Cham work, the next step is 
uh, is putting together this book project that will be, you know, fine arts documentary portraiture that's both family portraits and portraits of communities that I interacted with, um, with my friend um, Asuro Cham, who, um, whose family is from both Vietnam and Cambodia. So it's really, that has been a really valuable um, full circle for me as a Cham person of Vietnamese descent who um, has had to fight an, a narrative even within the Cham community that we're like the original Cham and stuff. It's like, we should not pull, you know, rank over other Cham people. We need to have an inclusive vision that crosses those national borders. And so that's been really important to me. I also did um, film or video work in both of those communities. And I have an unfinished uh, film projects um, that, that sent her documentary interviews and experiences of those communities. So um, that's been the Chom specific work and where it's gone from there. And then tons of other kinds of photographs, you know, that have nothing to do with any of this and paintings and other things too. Um, but thank you for asking. Oh, <laughs> thank you all. Um, I just want to take a temperature check. Um, it's 530 right now. Um, and I just want to see and check in how we're feeling about doing a breakout room or different breakout rooms. We can also add different subjects if we wanted, um, or we can continue with this Q&A that has been going so well. And, and um, we're learning a lot, I think, from each of you. Um, I thought I, I might just add something to the Q&A um, if we're going to wrap it and go into breakout rooms because, um, you know, so much power in just everything I've seen and heard today. I, I'm trying to kind of gather my thoughts around it because it, it's beyond thinking. It's, it's just so much beyond thinking. It's just kind of in all my feeling tones. So thank you, everyone. But um so I have tried to pull a few things together thematically, and, and this is what kind of just came out um, in terms of, of AWA as an organization. So and the, the works that have been presented, um, appearance and disappearance, courage, strength and resilience, migration and ascension, documentation and makers of worlds, color, texture and language. So much more that's just kind of a condensed way of crystallizing some of what came out of it for me. And so putting that forward for the conversation, I wonder if anyone wants to speak to this idea of an inclusive vision for, for AWA. In other words, is there something that could be related to as a kind of collective consciousness as, as an organization, Asian American women, because, you know, obviously the power in the work is, is in the specificity and in the, in the visual conversations. If, if we were to step back in the macro view. Yeah, I don't know. And my response to that is that it's hard because like Asian Americans, that term itself is filled with so many different kinds of people and filled with so many different kinds of stories. So it's hard to encapsulate like just a macro kind of like where we're at in terms of like basing it off of identity. Um, in terms yeah. of the organization. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yes, the whole, the whole conversation today is, is about the, the power of that cultural specificity. So mm -hmm. how do we bring that together in, in your organization as an entity then, knowing the problematic of such a broad-based yeah. Moniker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I meant. To I say. mean, I, I would love to open it up to other AWA staff and volunteers and board to share as well uh, on their perspectives. But I think, I think from my, my standpoint, I think just continuing to share our stories and from different contexts 
have been really helpful. Um, Michelle has been our, our exhibitions manager over the past few years and, um, and is now board president and the shows she's curated um, have been thematic in terms of like a lot of the different stories within our, our histories. Um, and it's, it's really amazing to like see how we all come together and like merge in terms of our different stories um, through our collaboration, through exhibitions and programs. Um, and I think on AWA's end, our mission is also to advance the visibility and recognition of Asian American women in the arts. So, um, so part of that is also developing an ecosystem where, where Asian American women can thrive and, and build um, like their professional careers as artists and also curators um, through our Emerging Curators Program. Um, and then we also have our membership program, um, which is open to artists um, who are Asian American women identified and then um, affiliates and supporters. Um, so affiliates are more like art, art professionals. So if you're interested in signing up, um, there's that as well. Um, and art professionals of any ethnicity or gender and same as goes for supporters. Those are our cheerleaders. Paloma is also one of our supporter <laughs> members. Um, so yeah, I think that's a gist of, of what AWA does in terms of um, uh, bringing, bringing Asian American women together and in, in building recognition toward, toward our contributions and whatnot. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else from AWA wants to share their thoughts on that. But thank you for that, that bringing that up, Tressa. Um, hi everyone, I'm Melanie Lynn. I'm the Programs and Communications Manager at AWA. And I just wanted to share, I think another really strong um, thing that I find about the AWA community is that it's very intergenerational. We have um, artists from like in their teens <laughs> all the way to like in their eighties. And um, be, just being in that intergenerational space and being able to share stories with, with you know, different generations is very powerful in itself. And um, I think there's like, you know, like Diana talked a little bit about the Merging Curators program. There's some mentorship that's also built in um, into, into AWA as well, because like, as for me, like I recognize that there have been other Asian American women and artists who've sort of paved the way through their legacies and, and um, things that they've had to fight for in order for us to be able to share what we're sharing today so openly, right? And then even the younger generation, like we have our newer volunteers, um, we have interns who are coming through, um, you know, they're, they're taking part in that legacy and and we're here to sort of honor that in the work that we do and so yeah that's just like something that I wanted to bring to to the discussion yeah thanks Melanie yeah I would like to say something mm -hmm. I did what I've learned today was um from Dr. Masuma Ahmed when she said invoiceable, bringing invoiceable voices into the mainstream, I think that's what I got out of this more than anything else, that even in curating shows with um, Asian women and men, getting um, their stories is very difficult to get to hear the story and then to decide what to use. But I think what you're doing is you're bringing voices into the mainstream that we haven't heard before. And I think it's really the most important thing I got out of this. Um, the art was incredible. The ideas and the um, execution was unbelievable, is unbelievable. And I've seen so much art, but today I saw things I've never seen before, unique visions. And uh, so thank you very much. This was really great. Yes, thank you, Gail. Yes. I think uh, like pointing to the importance of sharing our voices, um, Melanie shared all the artists' websites um, through the chat. Um, so if you all are able to spread the word and, and share what you saw today, um, I think that'll really help in supporting the artists too. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Diana. Uh -huh. It's Susie. Hi, Susie. How are you? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, so for folks who don't know, Susie was our executive director um, 
uh, the past few years. So, um, and and is here today. Thank you for joining us, Susie. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is I really miss this connection. I've been away for a couple of years and jumping on today, I forget how powerful our stories collectively just come through. And in this time of COVID especially, um, you guys are still doing an amazing job. So I um, just wanted to uh, give um, accolades to the team. Um, but just to kind of echo Melanie and Diana, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I would say I'm more of an arts administrator than an artist, but I come into these spaces and art is such a powerful connecting tool to feel as if your story is sometimes being told through other people's lenses and, and told in a way that's emotionally emotionally touching um, by your courage to kind of voice what you are feeling to help us understand and go deeper within ourselves. And I think that's where AWA provides that space. I mean, I think as Diana mentioned, you know, there's all of these, like there's the, the structure, right? The, the shows and the curation and opportunity to curate you know, they go after grants, they go after opportunities to give their members this platform to speak, whatever that platform is, whether it be a show, whether it be an internship or, and then there's also, as Melanie discussed, like this connection of people. But I, I also think even with, it's the structures, yes, for sure. That's what gets us together. That's what brought you all here today. But it's also like this inner interconnection, like of emotion and feeling just like almost unspoken. Like you cannot, I, what I saw today was just mind blowing and how all of you kind of have taken your experiences and created this, this beautiful experience for all of us to share. And I think that's what art does, um, but it, it touches us person to person every any all the energy that's in this room from all of you kind of all of us together and I think that's what AWA does incredibly well um you know I don't I felt today like I was a part of each of your um experiences and I and even virtually I was able to follow that and watch you and and feel you and like reflect on my own you know issues and journeys that I go through too. So I think AWA is able to, um, to do that even, even more powerfully um, as every year goes by. And I'm just so proud of you, Diana and Michelle and Melanie, and you know, all of our volunteers that have like taken that next step, um, you know, from one generation of leadership to the next. And, and I, I just wanted to kind of share that emotion and to all of the artists that I saw today, you know, thank you so much for just having the courage to, um, to share that with the rest of us and the rest of the world. So that's yeah. all. <laughs> thank you so much, Susie, for those affirming words. Um, I just want to share that it does feel like we are on like a really nice journey together in this larger group. And so um, we're just going to nix the breakout room idea um, since we just have 20 more minutes uh, left together. Um, but I, I do want I I'm also thinking about Susie's comment about like just um, making sure like you're sharing your own artwork from your own perspective and like like the fact that y'all did that today and, and like, like, that's amazing. And I think I want to honor that because, because there, there are these exhibitions that we show in all the time. Um, but there, it's a rare chance to like, be able to, to like speak from the heart about your own work and, um, and in four minutes, no less, like, <laughs> so thank you all. Um, yeah. Any feelings or, or that are coming up, um, that artists want to share too.
I just want to thank everyone um, for these personal stories are, um, they're so powerful as so many of us have expressed. And there's something about the way that it, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's so, they're so specific um, in heart and in pain and uh, experience, but then there's a way that it describes the whole of us. There's like this contracting and expanding that happens just like creates this kind of cadence, <laughs> you know, it's like Asian America. And then it's like so specific to down to our personal story. <laughs> and it just keeps doing that when we share. It's like transcendent, right? <laughs> like how, do, how does that happen? How does one story describe <laughs> so much? So I just really appreciate this time and effort and heart and all of this. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to bring up uh, in the chat, uh, folks are sharing some resources and ways to get connected and involved in some projects. Lisa, or sorry, not Lisa, Laura dropped, Laura Kina dropped some links there too. Um, if anyone has like, I, I know um, there are a couple of you were saying you were looking for other artists to get involved with some of your things. Please feel free to share. We would love it if you all like were able to collaborate on something or just get connected. Um, I think that's something that AWA does really well is like, you know, sometimes you'll meet other artists, like kind of what Trin was saying, like um, their work resonates with you and, and, you know, that can lead to other projects or other um, other series or exhibitions later. Um, I love the idea of that as someone who is uh, about making sure that there are like community building relationships as part of like our arts community. Um, yeah. so please feel free to share some, some of the things you're working on or if you're looking for other folks to collaborate with. Yeah, I guess since we have 15 minutes left, we can start sharing announcements here and there if anyone wants to share anything. Oh, can I just, I just yeah. wanted to say something. Um, I'm Sherry and I've been with AWOL a while. And so when, I just want to share that when we did the first slide slam several years ago, um, we were all in the studio you know, in one place, <laughs> really close together, sitting on the floor. And um, it was really wonderful being in that same space and sharing it. But it's so interesting to see that it's it's just as powerful, you know, on a Zoom and the advantage of having you from across the country. I and mean, I think that that is, um, adds so much to it. And then I was, you know, we were a little concerned about, you know, well, then afterwards you can't, you know, it's so nice to network with people one-on-one. -on -one with specific questions, but I think that me hearing other people's questions, you know, as an artist and hearing your responses, it's really like, oh yeah, that's what I've been, you know, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say, yeah. <laughs> so um, I really thank you all for sharing and um, just wanted to add that a little bit. Thank you, Sherry. So if we're sharing resources, I would like to share in case some of you are not aware of it. I don't think Lydia is in the house right now to um, speak on her own behalf. Uh, I checked and I didn't see her. So I just want to uh, say that uh, Lydia and I worked on a project together called Entering the Picture, um, Judy Chicago, the Fem Fresno Feminist Art Program and the Collective Vision of Women Artists. And I have a chapter on some of my work and she has a chapter on no other than the Asian American Women Artists Association, eight, 1989 to the present. Well, the present was 2011, which is when the book came out with Rutledge Press. So um, if any of you are interested you know, in the history of your organization, if you came into it later than that, I just wanted to let you know that that's out there in the world if you didn't know. Thanks. Yeah, um, there's also another book that came out by La Laura Fantone, who is a um, Italian so, uh, uh, cultural, what, what do you call it? <laughs> Women and Gender Studies um, professor and, and researcher. And 
Um, she wrote a book called Local Invisibility, Postcolonial Feminisms that came out in 2018. And we just did an artist panel with her and Nancy Hom and two emerging artists, Menaja Ganesh and Greer Nakadagalui, who's the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate right now. And um, so a lot of these uh, resources you can also now find on AWAS publications page when you go to our website. Um, so there's, uh, so there's uh, entering the picture and local invisibility on there as well, as well as some of AWA's um, publications, including our Cheers to Muses anthology and um, Bernice Bing. And you can find our commission project uh, of the mural that we did in the, in the Richmond area of San Francisco too. Um, if, you, if you're interested in learning more about what AWA has done over the years. Any other announcements for me? Or resources? Um, I have I have an announcement if I could share. Um, I someone had mentioned uh, you from Massachusetts, and I have a show up right now called Hostile Terrain, and it's a it's a group show uh, with Sanctuary City Project um, that focuses on the immigration. Um, crisis um, and a lot of the work I have up there that's where actually Hume's portrait is on display right now um, there's a lot of like interactive work too that that focuses on the fear um, that we um, have to fight within ourselves um, so um, yeah it's at gallery 51 at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts and it's up until I think at the end of changing <laughs> um it's up for sure for six it just went up last month and it's up for six months um for sure and then, yeah right. yeah Thank if you. folks have friends in massachusetts please please spread the word <laughs> I, I have a uh, um uh to share palo alto public art has a call for artists and I posted on the chat side the link. So if you're interested, because our voices need to be heard across. <laughs> so I feel very strongly that artists from this group would share their, would submit their artwork to Palo Alto Public Art. So I provided the link on the chat. So please feel free to use that. And I hope some of, you are, some of the artists will apply because I was one of the BLM artists selected to do the BLM artwork in Palo Alto. So I feel very strongly that we need to get involved. Thank you. Definitely. I grew up in San Mateo myself. So just like having artwork in the peninsula uh, by people of color represented is amazing. So <laughs> if anyone's interested in that, in that uh, definitely reach out to Masma or find the link that she pasted. Um, anything else? Anyone else have any last thoughts or comments or announcements, resources, anything? Um, if not, um, I'm so grateful for everyone joining us today. Um, oh, Paloma also just shared a really important um, pilot program that is in San Francisco right now um, that provides $1,000 of unrestricted funding. Um, to artists. Um, so if you are a San Francisco resident, um, definitely look out for that as well. Um, and yes, thank you, Elisa, for sharing um, info about can Cantor. And oh, yeah, I'm in a show at Cantor. <laughs> um, uh, when, when Home Won't Let You Stay, um, Migration Through Contemporary Art. Um, and that's what Elisa linked in there. Yeah, you beat me there. That's what I was looking for. Um, and uh, yes, I did hear that it that the Cantor Museum at Stanford will open its doors on April 21st. Um, so I'm gonna go there and try and visit with my family um, as well. But thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I have so much gratitude for the conversation that we had and and all the artists that presented and all of our special guests. 
Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience as well for participating and uh, lots of lots of gratitude. Um, again, uh, feel free to re reach out and learn more about AWA on our website, awa.net, um, and subscribe to our newsletter, sign up for our membership. Um, members, if you have more announcements, you can also always submit them through our community events form um, on our website under community events. Um, so yeah, we'll stay in touch. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Diana, thank, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, everyone. Thanks and everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. Bye everyone. thank you so much for sharing. So we can leave. Oh, yes. And Daniel, we can stop recording.